All right, well, good. Well, we're so excited to have a conversation that is uh, building on several conversations in and around this theme here at the podcast. And we've actually had our, our guest on, Glenn, on before, but he's got a couple of resources that you already heard Daniel mention, and I want to talk about some of how they relate to, uh, well, first, let's talk about the what it relates to pastoral health. So, so uh, Glenn, you talk a lot about, and rightfully so, and I need to learn and grow about pastoral health. What are the major markers? What are some major markers of pastoral health? And how do you think pastors are doing in general? Hey, Ed, good to be on your show again. And yeah, this is something I'm passionate about, as you are. And it's something that is a matter of great ur urgency. You know, you know, this this statistics that Barna released uh, last year, I think it was 43% of pastors seriously quitting, uh, seriously considering quitting. Uh, I think that survey was done again this uh, pretty recently, and not much has changed. In other words, we're still at a place where pastors feel exhausted. And I think one of the metaphors that can be helpful here, I used to pastor in a city uh, that uh, Colorado Springs that has the highest number of military installations out of anywhere in the country, I think. And so we would we would interact with soldiers who would come back from Afghanistan or Iraq or serving overseas, sometimes in, in combat situations or high stress situations. And the PTSD doesn't show up until you're back in kind of normal life, so to speak. And those are the moments where you find yourself kind of getting, you know, triggered or, or, or set up. And, and I think there's a, a little bit of a parallel here for pastors. Everybody's saying, well, hey, COVID's over. You know, you're back to normal. Is your building full yet? And I think what pastors are saying is, well, no, it's it's not the same. Uh, it's encouraging. There's good signs of life, you know, for a lot of pastors. Maybe giving is sort of uh, surging a little bit. Maybe attendance is surging. But I think what's surfacing is all of the wounds that we acquired over the last couple of years that now we actually have the time and space to pay attention to. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I, I just had a conversation earlier today with, you know, now that we're both in Southern California, but had a conversation with one of our fellow Southern California pastors. And, and, you know, he was just talking about how, you know, we've sort of come to the other side of some of these things, but yeah. uh, not with everybody, you know, and that's part of the reality. This has probably been, I haven't done like any official research. This is my anecdotal observation, but I think this is the, probably the greatest time of church switching that we've seen yes. in our lifetime, huge yes. number of church switching. So it's kind of like we, we made it through, but not with everybody and with new people and yeah. And, and what, what he said to me was really interesting. He said, it's just like, I just don't know what the new footing is, yes. which I think is, is interesting language as well. Um, one of the things too, you, you and Holly co-authored the book that Daniel mentioned, uh, The Intentional Year, Simple Rhythms for find, Finding Freedom, Peace, and Purpose. I think a lot of people are just saying, how do we find that again in what yeah. clearly is the new normal? This is, it yes. seems like things are not going back. So what does it look like to get to some of those rhythms? So you asked me earlier, what are some of the markers of health? And I described, you know, wounds surfacing instead. But I think to, to kind of put these two questions together, Ed, one of the markers of health is that we're able to have some sense of agency in our own life. And we use that agency in a way that creates kind of rhythms and intentionality. Um, the, 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 the surest way to get towards a place of despair is to feel like you have no control over your life or over the world. And in fact, even secular psychology says to us that hope, we need hope, uh, the, the requirement for hope um, in a cognitive sense, there's a Charles Snyder's, a psychologist that has done a lot of research on this, is you need a sense of agency, a sense that you can act on uh, elements of your life. Now, for so many pastors, we're like, well, I can't control the pandemic and I can't control who's coming to my church. And I can't control the fact that they're switching churches. And so we just sort of want to throw in the towel and give up all um, hope instead of saying, OK, but what are the things within my care? What, you know, to use sort of the old preacher phrase like Moses, what is in your hand, you know, or El Elijah to the widow? What's the oil in your house? What's something that you actually can do? And what my wife, Holly, and I, what, what we really feel burdened by is to be able to say to pastors particularly, okay, what about the rhythms in your own life, in your own home, if you're married, in your own marriage? And so for a dozen years or so, Holly and I would take time out to do this retreat. And we began doing it once a year. We do it at the end of a year, late December, sometimes early January. But then it didn't take very long before we started doing this retreat, retreat twice a year. And the whole idea, it, it's pretty simple, but it's a set of practices that go in a particular sequence. And the book walks you through that. But it starts by looking back. And this is that whole thing about discovering where the wounds are, discovering what, what the impact of the previous season 
uh, is on your soul right now. And so there's an ancient prayer called the prayer of examine. And some people may be familiar with that, where you, you sort of let yourself rest, you review, uh, and, and then you give God thanks, you rejoice, you also repent for where you've fallen short, and then you receive grace. Well, we started, uh, this is not original to us, but we started using that prayer of examine to reflect back, not just on a day or a week, but actually on an entire year. And I talked to a friend today, again, another sort of anecdotal story. I talked to a pastor today who said, you know what? I went and did this, uh, just that exercise with my wife. And we went all the way back to January of last year. We we, we looked, opened our journals and began to, and we, we couldn't believe the turbulence that we had walked through in a 12 month span. And I think that's true for so many pastors. Like we're just kind of soldiering on. We don't even stop to, to reflect and and review. So that's the first phase. I'll just name the next two and then you can, Please. you know, we can visit any of them. And then the next phase after that review is to sit and listen and allow the Holy Spirit to help you discern what the season is for. I, I think there are so many voices that are, are trying to convince us of what we need to make our priority and what we need to give attention to. Even for me, Ed, I, you know, I have taken over a church here in Southern California. And the first several months, I intentionally was listening to other people. I wanted to listen, to learn, to catch up on the story. But there came a point about three or four months in where I, I really sensed the Lord saying to me, it's time to center my voice and not the voices of other people. And I think this is what we need as pastors is we need to create that space to center the voice of the Lord, to say to us, this is what this season is for. And this is what you need to give your attention to for this season. Like a good farmer, my father-in-law just retired from farming in Iowa. A good farmer does the work that fits the season. You, you, there's a certain time to sow. There's a certain time to cut the wood for the fires in the winter, you know, all of that. So then the third uh, and final phase of the book is taking an inventory of five key areas of your life from prayer, rest, renewal, relationships, and work. And as you take an inventory, you begin to say, what are some simple things I could do in a kind of rhythmic way every week or every month or every quarter um, for each of those areas? And then how can I actually put them in my calendar so they get built in? And for pastors, we are professional reactors, or maybe to put it, put it more uh, positively, we're professional responders. Mm. And the intentional year is an invitation to actually be proactive, to schedule first what matters most in our life with God, in our life with our families, and in our life with others. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I've been on, I've been on a sabbatical, but I, I'm clearly not very good at sabbatical. Um, so, and you know, sabbatic, academic sabbaticals are different than pastoral sabbaticals. Yes. You know that. Yes. So, you know, I taught over in the UK where you studied and, and uh, with your old, with your old professor mentor, uh, Tom Wright and I taught a <laughs> friend, course. Yeah, friend, yeah. Uh, friend. Okay. I'm not quite sure how the relationship yeah. was, but yeah, I remember yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. No formal academic relationship. No worries. No worries. That's okay. We all got to like, no, no, that's not, that's not what I meant. Y'all, all good. But, but he, we, he, he knows you and he loves you. So, um, so, but, but, you know, so it's a little different, but one of the things I learned is, is that during that time I had, uh, I got, I got two, um, tightly wound about some things and the Lord's been sort of working that in my heart. But, but I got to tell you, for me, you know, part of my challenges, and I think I, I want to reflect on your challenges that every pastor at every stage, every person in ministry at every stage um, sort of fills up with and can get tightly wound around the role of ministry, uh, whatever, whatever he or she's doing, they can get kind of caught up in that, you know, whether it's a staff role, pastor role, whatever. And, and you're here now, you're pastoring a, uh, a large church uh, in Southern California. And most of the people who are writing in the kind of spiritual health space are not also leading. And sometimes that causes them to get discounted. I don't think that's a good thing. Sure. But someone's like, well, that person's, you know, they're, they're really, you know, doing praying and meditating and seeking the scripture. So, so but our, our audience tends to be pastors and church leaders who, whatever the size of their church, would tend to see themselves as busy. I mean, yeah. because they are, not to see themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so how do we import some of these things into our lives? Because one of the reasons that, I mean, we don't have a lot of times people come twice. No. Uh, but but we, I just think it's so important. And I think you kind of come from a unique angle. So, so here I am, I'm an associate pastor, I'm a pastor, I'm a church planner. How, how do I import some of this health into what, what does it take and how do I get yeah. there? Well, there, there are some, there's a page we can take from the playbook of, uh, you know, of people who write and study on habits and all this stuff. And some people call it the idea of, of stacking or bundling. 
it, it, the idea, the concept is when you do one thing, make it the, the moment that you do these other things as well. So you're sort of batching together. And that's a bit of a habit hack um, where, where instead of saying, you, you mean I need to find two practices for five spheres? I'm doing the math, Glenn. That's 10 different. I can't do 10 different spiritual disciplines. No, it, it may not be like that. It may be something as simple as saying, um, okay, when I work out, I'm also going to listen to an audio book or I'm also going to queue up a, a set of podcasts. Maybe that's what you're doing right now is you're listening to this podcast. And so that you're renewing your body while you're renewing your mind. You know, you're sort of, you're, you're batching together some things that can work. But there's also the notion of uh, something that could be called a meta practice. I think the Sabbath is something like that. The Sabbath actually speaks to five areas of our life, all five of those spheres. The Sabbath is when we don't work. The Sabbath is when we do rest. The Sabbath is maybe when you pray uh, uh, in a particular way. Maybe there's a particular psalm or passage of scripture that you pray on, on a Sabbath. Sabbath could be a time when you enjoy company with friends. So there's the relational piece of it. And Sabbath could be a chance for something that you delight in, like a bike ride in southern, in sunny Southern California. You know, so so there are these ways of saying, okay, it's it doesn't need to be overwhelming. You can you can think about batching or bundling together a few key things. Things, or you could think in terms of a meta practice. So I'll give you one example. At Rock Harbor, the church that I get to serve and lead, um, we we do something called a day with God, and we give every full time staff person a paid day with God. And the reason this is so valuable is because everybody knows they quote unquote should spend uh, you know extra time or longer time with God. But you got, you know, if you're married, if you have kids, you're like, I, I can't take more time away from my family or from the pressures of work. So we give it to them and it's eight to five. So they're not away from their family any more than they would be if they were in the office. But the idea is no errands, no, you know, no, no anything else. This is your time to go journal, to go pray, to go walk, to do something that uh, renews you. And it happens every month. So, of course, there's systems that we have for sabbaticals and vacations and all of that. But but again, we want people to live rhythmically rather than sporadically. Yeah, so that, that is interesting that you actually intentionally do that. I, I think part of my assumption was, because I love Jesus, um, because I want to serve him, that I would naturally end up in rhythms of sustainable rhythms. And yeah. and yet uh, I'm, you know, I'm 56 years old. And so far, I have not naturally gotten to sustainable rhythm. So maybe, I mean, I'm guessing you're younger than me. So maybe, maybe you've, you struck or maybe, maybe it's your background. I don't know. Maybe it's because oh. you're Anglican and I'm not. Um, so, um, so, so what, how, intentionality obviously is key. Yeah, so key. Um, how do I, how do I, if I'm not in being intentional, what are some ways to start? What are some beginning points yeah. to do that? I, I like the idea of bundling some of those things, but, but I, yeah. I got to start. Where do I start? Yes. So let me just say one quick thing there. Ed. I, Holly and I are not the most like uber disciplined people. It's not like we're, we, we, we began doing this because we needed it and we became okay. desperate for it. But secondly, even when we have these plans or things, you know, kind of built in it, um, it doesn't mean adherence to it is a hundred percent. In fact, it may be a, a good week is 60%, you know, okay. like everything that was sort of, well, made. that encourages me that you're terrible at this too. Yeah. So that's, yeah. That's good. But again, so a, a, a nautical analogy, you know, we, we look out our windows here and we can see Catalina Island on a clear day. We're going to make everybody jealous here, you know, in other parts of the country. But, but if you, if you set your course in a particular direction and you drift a little bit, you at least won't be that far off. But if you don't set a course, you're, you're going to be adrift. And so I think even the idea of intentionality is not perfection or 100% achieve. It's not performance driven at all. It's meant to say, Lord, let me aim my heart in a direction. And even if I'm drifting, I'm not drifting that far off, you know. Um, so having said that, the, a key place to start could be to take a day and do one piece of the, the retreat thing that I that I described. So yeah. maybe your very first thing, and, and I think to an exhausted pastor, to an exhausted church leader, maybe the most important one is the examine applied over the last year. So take a day and go through those, the, the, there's like four or five steps of the examine, let your body come to rest, begin to review the last season, whether that's using the photos on your phone or the journal that you've been writing in, um, or, the, you know, or your text messages over the last year, that could be dangerous, um, you know, complainers or whatever. So, so review and, and then rejoice, begin to thank God and then repent and then receive grace. So that could be, that could be a half a day's worth of work, but that alone will at least help you locate yourself. 
if you're busy, if you're exhausted, the thing that we're um, running the risk of is we actually don't know how we're doing. You know, so I'm doing all this resilient pastor stuff. We're we're traveling. We did some live events. We did some roundtables, and it's been so beautiful. And it's been sort of uh, eye opening to say, man, pastors they're not even beginning to think about the question of how are you really, you know? And so the best gift you could give yourself, your spouse, your church is to give yourself that time, five hours, eight hours, whatever it can be to take that little assessment by reviewing uh, the season you've just come out of. That's good. Okay. So um, when you wrote resilient pastor, I mean, people don't necessarily realize that it, it takes a long time to well, maybe it doesn't take you a long time. It takes yeah, me a long does. time to write a book. This is a man who's actually been four and a half years late on my book for InterVarsity Press. So I'm like the worst. <laughs> but, but you know, if, if I was actually good at this, I would write it in a year. Then it takes, you got to turn it in a year. It takes a year. So for the book, your book, Resilient Pastor, to come out yeah. in February 2022, yeah. uh, that was actually a process during some very tumultuous and turbulent times. Um, so now that it's more than a year since you published it, um, anything you'd see is like new things or additional observations about the overall health of pastors since the book was released? I mean, I, I think it was a wake up call for people, not the book. I mean, just the season that pastors have come right. out of. And so now when I talk to pastors, they are saying they're like, you know what? I really do need to prioritize this and I really do need to pay attention to. So there is a hunger on two fronts, Ed. The first, the first front is... I'm seeing a hunger for relationships among pastors. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, you know, I'm the new kid in, in Orange County, you know, several months now, but I'm, every time I reach out to a pastor who's been here, hey, can we get together? Can we, you know, there's this hunger of saying, you know, I'm looking for this too. And I've been here for years or, or, or whatever it might be. And I, I talk to friends around the country and it's, it's similar because there is, I don't want to say there's a unique weight, like, oh, poor pastors, there, you know, different vocations have different challenges. But one of the challenges of spiritual leadership is it's very hard to disassociate yourself from that role. So, so you know, if, if you're a doctor, but you're at the restaurant, I don't know, maybe doctors, it is like that. They'll say, hey, is there a doctor here or whatever? But when you're when you carry the weight of spiritual leadership, wherever you are in a community, people can't not see you as carrying that role. And that that's a, a high weight. That's a, a beautiful and sacred thing. And it also means you need some authentic relationships with people uh, where you can be honest, where you can be um, uh, vulnerable, where you can be human. Um, I have felt the need for that. I think I have, I've re-engaged my sessions with my own spiritual director. Um, and so I, I've seen that as a follow-up trend too, where more pastors are, it's, it's become more normal to talk about seeing a counselor or seeing a therapist or seeing a, uh, a spiritual director. So that's a really good thing. So that's the hunger for relationships. The other thing that I'm seeing, Ed, and I think, you know, even when we look back at the Asbury outpouring and all of that, however we describe that, there is a hunger for the presence of God, um, for God to do something beyond what we can. And I, I think, you know, we, we've all come out of this season of we, we, we've been trying with our tech and we've been trying with our programs and we're trying to do all the things that we can. But we know at the end of the day, you know what we need is we need the Holy Spirit to, to show up in a special way, in a way that we can't manufacture, in a way that we can't manipulate. And I love hearing that from pastors all around the country, that you know, I, the Resilient Pastor book ends, the final chapter of the book ends with a, a chapter called The Presence and the Power, um, which, is, which is a way of saying resilience at the end of the day is not grit. It, it, for, for me, it's not, a, it's not a synonym for grit. Resilience, like resurrection, is something that we receive, not something that we achieve. It's a work of grace. It's a work of the Holy Spirit. The same Spirit who raised Christ from the dead uh, will raise us up, will renew our inner being and renew our churches too. So the hunger for relationships and the hunger for the presence and power of God uh, those are things I've observed kind of a, over a year out now from the book. Yeah. And it's interesting. I, you know, I, I probably, cause with the word resilience now you own, cause everyone, you know, you wrote the book. So you literally wrote the book on it, but like, I'm, I do this seminar. I'm, I'll be, uh, at the time of this recording, I'll, I'll be tonight at, uh, at our, one of our other Southern California churches at, at Saddleback church, mm -hmm. uh, talking to their leadership. And I'll be talking about, we're going to need, uh, and still need, uh, what I'm calling reservoirs of resilience and communities of support. That's kind of a recurring theme for me over and over again, reservoirs of resilience, communities of support. Um, one of the things that I think um, a lot of pastors don't, don't have a natural inclination towards, though I'm really pleased to hear, like I was listening to a pastor the other day say, you know, I, I, I talked to my counselor about, and I'm just like, what a, what a great way to normalize that, you know, sermons break stigmas. That's a good thing. Um, 
But you also mentioned spiritual directors as well, which is not as common as a thing. And you're in the Anglican tradition, um, <laughs> and but not 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 Rock Harbor. So right, didn't did Rock Harbor come out of Mariners? Is that what I understood it or did. no? It did. Okay. Yeah, twenty. Yeah, it was nineteen ninety seven, I believe, was the year that Rock Harbor was planted out of Mariners. Yeah. Nice. So I'm uh, for those who don't know, I'm a teaching pastor at Mariners. So we're we have these friendships, these relationships. There okay. So um, so so what would it look like for a pastor to may, maybe you know maybe not maybe they want to get counseling great um but the spiritual director thing what would it look like to have and i think those are I mean, they're not the same thing by any stretch of imagination but somebody else speaking into your life yes. is something that i think pastors need it could be spiritual director could be counseling yep. depending on the situation could yep. be an older friend um yep. what does that look like what are some ways to do that well i think i think all, some of the things you just named are actually a little bit different and it's worth a pastor thinking through the difference of that so we do need sages and mentors in our life that's really beautiful to have you know and and thank god there are some some wise seasoned women and men who are finishing the race or have you know well uh, that we can look up to a and we do need truth tellers which are more you know friends that know us and they can speak you know the truth to us but I, I think the role of a, a counselor or even a spiritual director is more like a healer. And it's a different kind of voice in our life that isn't a pure voice. It's an asymmetrical relationship right. where you are at the bottom instead of at the top. Right. So for, for pastors and church leaders, we are almost all our relationships are asymmetrical, but right. we're on the top. And we need to reverse that every now and again. And a counselor and a spiritual director. And you're right, they're a little bit different. I mean, you you know, at Talbot, you guys have this whole Institute of Spiritual Formation, which is really beautiful. We have several of our people at Rock Harbor who've been trained through that. And it's whereas a counselor is going to have some some techniques and some clinical approaches that 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 uh, you know obviously relies on psychology, and that's beautiful. Spiritual directors are essentially people who are trained at how to pray with you, listen to God with you, and help you. Uh, uh, catch things that, that that maybe you're missing, you know? And so my spiritual director will frequently say to me, boy, I wonder what God might be trying to say to you in the midst of this or that. Mm. And I'm sort of like, no, I don't, I just want to move on and I want to fix this, 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 and this, you know? I got stuff to do. Yeah, I got stuff to do. <laughs> I got stuff to do. So you're right. Sermons break stigmas. It's a wonderful thing to normalize it. Uh, and, and I think for a pastor, maybe the counseling thing is like, uh, do you see a counselor when something's broken or when something's okay? I, I, you know, different people have different schools of thought on that. But a, a spiritual director is almost like just routine checkup. It's like a wellness check in the doctor's yeah. office instead of a you you went in because you're sick. You know. No, and I think I think you articulated well what I what I was trying to get at too. Someone speaking into your life is different than your friends who okay, I guess I can speak truth to you, but yeah. you've placed yourself under the you know in, in the african-american tradition um and and not, not just, also in some pentecostals that sometimes you have a covering pastor yeah. Yeah. so john jenkins who's a who's a dear friend and uh and had the privilege of walking with him through his getting his master's at wheaton but yeah. he he would say every pastor needs to pastor yes. and 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 you know and that's sometimes that's a little casual like i i see someone i look up to but it's more than that it's placing yourself in that kind of so there's communities of care but also something speaking asymmetrically as you yes as you said it and i think that's helpful um for you personally uh, there were times in your life when you were not living with healthy rhythms i'm sure there are but um what what, what changes and how, how did you get back into the healthy rhythms what changes did you make yeah i i, I appreciate that question ed I, I mean i you know you know this about me but before i, I was at rock harbor or before you know, coming to rock harbor i was at a new life church in colorado springs and I got there in the summer of 2000, and then in the fall of 2006 was when the founding senior pastor, Ted Haggard, had a pretty public moral failure. And I was in my late 20s at the time watching it all, you know, sort of front row seats and shock and disappointment, disillusionment, all that stuff. But it became very quickly less about someone else's failure and more about the condition of my own soul. And I realized how, as a young 20-something, how easy it is to get addicted to adrenaline, how easy it is to get enticed by the, the, the rush even the lie that you're doing this um, for the Lord. I shouldn't say the lie. The, the, the cover, you know, that masks over it is that you're doing it for the Lord. And, and I've learned over the years, I'm still prone to this temptation. And I figured out, you know, that this is a, an area where I need to have my elders now, or my, my wife is really great about calling this out. I mean, some close friends to say, I know the temptation to say yes to great things because it's exciting and it's, you know, it, it could feel significant 
but it's one of those things where an addiction to adrenaline, which that's a Eugene Peterson phrase, you know, I think years ago, Eugene wrote about, you know, pastors, all pastors are addicts, he said, but they're not addicts to these, these illicit drugs or something that would be shocking. What they're addicted to is actually the kind of stuff that we applaud them for. They're addicted to the adrenaline of a crowd, the, the, the adrenaline of momentum in your church. And so we have all these positive words for, for it. And it masks the fact that actually there's an unhealthy you have an unhealthy dependence or relationship uh, with this feeling, this rush of the church booming or or, or whatever. And so for me, that's the temptation. I, I, I've realized that's going to be the Achilles heel for me is either at work with the church or outside stuff that I want to say yes to. And so I have to embrace um, the discipline of saying no um, to, to things. I have to embrace the discipline of the ordinary, you know, um, and, and those are particular uh, t- vices or temptations for me. And I, I suspect for almost every church leader, the, the kind of gifts that draw you into leadership are also the kind of gifts that make you prone to that sort of addiction. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's important because the, uh, I, I, I say, you know, we all got pithy phrases in pastoral ministry, the desires that drive you sometimes become the demons that drag you down. Mm. Those desires can be like, good. I, I want to see more people come to Jesus. I mean, I'm a missiologist. I literally study what, what approaches and what cultural engagement works well and how, how do we want to do that more faithfully. So, so, so how do you know, cause I, I'm convinced that, you know, I work a lot with church planners. I'm convinced that, you know, it's not always like people say, well, you know, we just need to lean completely. It's hundred percent the Lord. Well, I mean, there's a certain wiring. We actually look for that wiring when it comes to church planners. Yes. So I think my personality, your personality and the personality of people listening is woven together with God's work yes. and, and yes. it's not all perfect and some of it's broken. So how, how do we look to see what is of God and what is of us and how do we walk through that rightly? It's a, it's a difficult thing. And I mean, I think having the right constellation of voices, I, I use the phrase constellation that I picked up from Paul Stanley and Bobby Clinton years ago, they wrote a book called Connecting where they said, you, you don't need one North star. You need a constellation of voices in your life. And I think that's the idea is people who are attentive to that. But again, Ed, going back to the intentional year, there's something proactive that we can do about this, you know? So uh, again, the, think of the metaphor of, of healthcare. Uh, if you only, the only time you think about health is when you're sick, well, that's not really the best way to do it, right? We want to get ahead of this. And so in a similar way for pastors, I, for myself, I want to know that I'm living between, uh, within my limitations by just choosing to do that. So, so I, you know, a very simple thing. I, I run my schedule, not only by my wife, but by a couple of the elders on our board. And I said, what do you think? Should I say yes to this or that? And they're helping monitor my capacity. Now, they don't technically, right? Like they technically have the right to tell me what I do beyond, you know, maybe not, but I'm choosing to submit um, to that. And maybe the most powerful thing we can do as leaders is to embrace the humility of submitting yourself. I mean, think about the Philippians to Jesus learned obedience through, you know, lowered himself and became obedient even to the cross. There's something we're meant to emulate there instead of saying, I'm in charge, I'll make all the calls to willingly submit, empty ourselves to say, you know, what? I'm going to let someone else speak into these decisions so that I can live within these limitations and not even get near the danger zone of running too fast, too hard. Okay, so what is, I mean, practically, what does that look like? You say you, like, do you, I, I talk to my wife about these things. I mean, in general, sometimes yeah, my wife would yeah. be like, don't, you don't need to ask me about that. <laughs> but, um, but, um, but so what does that look like? Well, you said you run it by your elders too, like, like someone yeah. invites you, you email them. How does it work? Give I, us that, the practicals. Yeah, that's it. So I, I, I put down like the next three months at a glance and I'll say, hey, these are the things I've, I've, I've um, uh, that are already there. And then now here's this one or two new things that have come up. Uh, what do you think? You know, and they'll say, yeah, it seems reasonable. You could do that. That's not getting on an airplane or that's, a, you know, uh, now not every little thing, you know, podcast, whatever. I'm not running that stuff. You by, didn't like check with your elders on hanging with me. No, no, I did tell them that I am, but I didn't. Check you might want to check with them. Cause I, you know, I could be <laughs> trouble. So. Uh, but usually if it's a, if it's a trip, uh, if it's an overnight or an ongoing commitment, serving on a board, you know, yeah. for something I'll say, hey, guys, what do you think about this? You know, um, I'll, I'll consult with them before I, I, um, will take on a book project, you know, and I, this is a practice. I did this at new life with, with Brady Boyd, but of course, then he was my senior pastor, literally my boss. And I was, right. you know, associate. Uh, so I, I wouldn't have to do that here, but I think there's a discipline in saying, would you guys at, at the very least speak into this? Give me your concerns. 
uh, help me with this. And I've talked to some friends who are also author speakers. You know, they they have something that they're doing beyond uh, the strict confines of the local church. And and there's agreed upon parameters. You know what the targets are, and then you actually um, you know invite people into that. Yeah. So so the the challenge is is that. Um... It's hard sometimes for us in our because of the asymmetrical relationships we have with elders and others is to have people say no to us. So yeah. uh, and I, I sometimes say if you're if your elders never say no, they're not elders, they're, you know, cheerleaders. Yeah. So um, so how, how do you get some people who actually say, uh, particularly you're you're relatively new at, at Rock mm-hmm. Harbor, so you're probably still in that honeymoon yeah. phase. Eventually, they'll get ready to say no to you. But so how do you <laughs> cultivate that kind of accountable relationship? Uh, not just now we're, we're moving from the asymmetrical where your spiritual director, of course, is mm-hmm. going to do that. But how do you do that in the church? You know, I uh, I listened to a great um, talk or a podcast, I think it was from Pete Scazzaro about about helping healthy boards. And I think he, he posted it after a significant leader had fallen, you know, one of the failures that had happened in the last couple of years. And he recommended, it's, I say this a bit tongue in cheek, but, but Pete recommended reading his book with your board, you know, <laughs> Emotionally Healthy Leader. Yeah. Um, and, I, you know, I was like, of course you recommend that we read your book, Pete. But at the same time, I Because <laughs> the boards doing, meets 10 yeah. more books each time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but to his credit, I mean, it is a good book and I am rereading it um, myself, but, but for the board, it's their first time through it. And we're going through it a chapter a month, you know, per, per meeting. And I tell you, Ed, the, when we started doing it, I was a little bit nervous. You know, it's got the word emotional in it. You know, yeah. like how do how do some of these high charging CEO types respond? But I said, you know what? Here's my goal. The number one, the most important word in the title is healthy, and that's what I want us to be as a board. Yeah. And you don't get health without humility, and you don't get that without the risk of some vulnerability. Uh, but my hope is that we get to a place of trust and transparency. And man, they dove in. Chapter one, we took 45 minutes instead of 30. And and so I hope that these are the seeds that will lead us to that place of trust and transparency. Um, I can't I can't say, look at us, this is what we've done. We're early in it. Um, but I can say I learned that from Pete and it seemed to have worked for him. Yeah. What word of encouragement would you give to pastors and church leaders as we close? I, it's my favorite, uh, line, um, uh, when I, when I think about, um, the John Wesley story, his, you know, the, 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 the legend is his final words to his, you know, to his crew were best of all, God is with us. And when I, you know, a friend of mine came to work for us at new life, he now leads new life downtown, Jason Jackson, incredible guy. And he, he actually studied at Asbury seminary and he brought me this card, uh, that I, is framed in my desk even today. And it says that very phrase, best of all, God is with us. And I think we could go down the list. We could say, aren't you glad the pandemic is over? Aren't you grateful that you, you know, and, and we could go down that list and lots of things that we could say that we're thankful for. But then I'd want to say, and best of all, God is with us. He, God is with us. Jesus is the head of the church. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. And man, we don't have to be all these things all at once. But one day at a time, one season at a time, as we discern what God is doing and we join him in it, that's the goal of every spiritual practice is to pay attention and then join God in what he's doing. Then by the grace of God, we're going to make it.